Black Elk Speaks, being the life story of an Aglala holy man. You have noticed that everything an Indian does is in a circle, and that is because the power of the world always works in circles. And everything tries to be round. In the old days, when we were a strong and happy people, all our power came to us from the sacred hoop of the nation. And so long as the hoop was unbroken, the people flourished. Around here in this area, we call it Indian ball. We get that ball up and down that court as fast as we can go. Um, when I was a little kid, I used to watch Jonathan and Elvis at these schools, and then I wanted to be like them. I was wanted to win a state championship. When I was starting to come up and everybody was talking about I might go to play Division One, they're all then I start hearing them, like you're just going to come back to the reservation, and it's, a lot of people get that into their heads. A lot of Native Americans, and it ain't about that. The path I took was because of basketball. In order to pick, play college ball, I had to go to school. I had to keep the grades up. I was really proud proud to get this chance to play here because I've wanted to be a Lady Grays ever since I was in eighth grade. I wanted to prove people I could play at the Division I level. I wanted to prove it to my people, my Blackfeet people, to the people in Cup Inc. and all around the state that I could make it there. Basketball is the most popular sport on Montana's seven Indian reservations. It started as a fun and inexpensive way to pass the time in rural Montana. But it grew into something much bigger. Basketball became a part of the Native American culture. Historically, Indian ball players have been some of the best in the state. Indian ball made its mark on Montana high school basketball, but it was noticeably absent at the college level. I'm Jonna Espinosa. Few talented Indian high school basketball players make it to the Division I college ranks, like here at the University of Montana. In this program, we'll explore some of the reasons why. You'll meet Indian basketball players from the past and the present who struggle with not with scoring points, but with learning to adjust to life away from the reservation. For many Native Americans, a home on the reservation is more than a place to live. It's a spiritual and cultural connection to other Indians and the land. In this report, you'll meet a Blackfeet man whose fears about going away to college nearly overwhelmed him. You'll follow a Crow High School basketball coach as he shows kids how to reach their potential. We'll introduce you to a ball player from the Flathead Reservation who's had great success and personal difficulty. And you'll see a Blackfeet woman honored by her tribe. Those athletes found ways to hang on to their traditional values while taking advantage of the opportunities offered at a four-year college. They did this not by leaving one world for another, but by making their circle wider to include both. Pack trophy cases in high schools throughout Montana reflect the rich history of Indian basketball. Larry Blacksmith is a former ball player and coach who lives on the Crow Reservation in South Central Montana. He grew up hearing stories about Crow basketball players from the 1930s. I think it started uh, around about 1935, I think, when it originally got where the interest in basketball really came to being with uh, such players as um, Edmund Ocrow. People would 
tell you about, on this reservation, would tell you about the uh, um, All-American, Crow All-American basketball team. Indian teams like the Crow All-Americans help set a standard of basketball excellence, winning many of their games by wide margins. Generations of skilled ball players became the modern day warriors of their community. Elvis Old Bull and Jonathan Takes Enemy are Montana basketball legends. Outstanding Indian high school players excited fans with a running and high scoring style of basketball that emphasized speed. We're allowed to run, we're allowed to pressure, we're allowed to uh, bring the ball up the floor a little bit harder, faster, uh, fast break. The individual talents were brought more to the forefront when they were uh, allowed to bring the ball up the floor faster. American Indian ball players helped popularize running gun basketball. Some Montanans call it Indian ball. Fast-paced hoops was especially popular within American Indian communities. It was exciting to watch and reminiscent of Plains Indian games involving skill and agility. In most uh, competitions, not only in basketball, but in most competitions, pertaining to Indians, a lot of it is uh, with running, with speed, you know, whether it's on horseback or on foot. Indian ball reached its peak in Montana in the 1980s and 90s, but great success at high school ball didn't translate to college basketball's highest level, Division I. In 1991, Sports Illustrated writer Gary Smith explored the scarcity of Montana Indians in college basketball. In an article called Shadow of a Nation, he described an ongoing pattern of gifted but troubled athletes unable to adjust to life off the reservation. He cited alcoholism, difficulty fitting into a culture they didn't always understand, and loneliness as the main reasons many Native Americans left college and returned to the reservation. Montana Indian coaches, former players, and educators agree those are some of the reasons Indian athletes don't stay at college. However, they emphasize the fact that American Indians experience much more than the normal degree of difficulty adjusting to college. Some Indian young people are shocked at how different life is off the reservation. They miss people who are like them and they fear the way they look, talk, and act will separate them from others when they're trying to fit in. What happens to some of these Indian athletes coming off these reservations is that it's a culture shock. Going to Missoula or Bozeman and, and um, the social aspect of the college, the town, they get caught up in that and it's difficult for them. Don Wetzel of Billings understands firsthand the difficulties Indian athletes face when they leave a reservation for college. In 1967, Wetzel left the Blackfeet Reservation to play basketball for the University of Montana in Missoula. He was the first member of a Montana tribe to play for an NCAA Division I team. As a high school ball player, Wetzel felt secure within his circle of family and friends on the reservation. But it was almost overwhelming to go outside beyond reservation boundaries. When I went and visited some campus, I was recruited by 100 colleges. And I would go to these places and I was blown away at the size, the people, you know, um, and it frightened me. It frightened me. Here's a kid rolling out a cut bank and off the reservation and boom into this. I knew I could compete at that level but it scared me. Wetzel forced himself to overcome his fears because he was determined to make a point. I mean, I wanted to prove people I could play at the Division I level. I wanted to prove it to my people, my Blackfeet people, to the people in Cup Bank and all around the state that I could make it there. So I had it in here. I mean, I had a little granary. I would put a little tin can up there and. And if the sun went down, I'd pull up my brother's pickup and I'd turn the lights on and I'd shoot for hours at that little can, thinking about 
college and thinking about, I'm going to make it, I'm going to play, you know? So you've got to have it in the heart. Wessel was a three-year starter at Montana and the team's most valuable player in 1971. He graduated with a degree in education. After college, he returned to the Blackfeet Reservation to work at Browning High School as a coach and administrator. In 1980, as boys basketball coach, he led the Browning Indians to a Class A state title. Kids on those reservations need to see those guys come out, or those girls, come out, make it in a college program, stick it out, and then, then they can show the kids, well, you know, you can do it. We want to win this, guys. We want to win this. You win four games. You win four games, you're a state champ. But it starts right here. Oh, Luke Spotted Bear is the high school boys basketball coach in the small town of Pryor on the Crow Reservation. You can usually find Luke hard at work in a gym. At well over six feet tall, Spotted Bear is a larger than life figure in this community. He's one of the best players to come out of this area. In 1981, Spotted Bear led his Plenty Coup High Warriors to a Class C state championship. All right, you can handle the ball. He's one of a handful of Montana Indians to make the jump from high school to college ball. Some Montana Native Americans fear they will be treated as outsiders at colleges away from the reservation. In Luke's case, that fear came true at Haskell Junior College in Kansas. Down in Kansas when I played in the Juco down there, you know, they just terrorized, terrorized me about my last name, you know, the whole, the whole Nine yards, I guess you want to call it, but you know. All right, be ready to go. All right. You guys know who Spotted Bear felt uncomfortable and unaccepted, so he transferred to the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota. You got the other guy. It was weird because at Mary, a lot of the students, they just took me for who I was, and that's why I really liked it there, and that's why I stayed and finished. Spotted Bear earned bachelor's and master's degrees in education. He completed school because he refused to give up. He was determined to do whatever he had to do to play college basketball. Like Wetzel, Spotted Bear demonstrated an internal drive to reach his goal. That commitment carried him over obstacles like cultural adjustment and loneliness that caused many Indian players to become discouraged and go home. Living on the Crow Reservation in Lodge Grass, Larry Blacksmith understands the pull of the Indian extended family. There are no orphans on the Crow Reservation. Um, a child can be without a parent, but always have a parent. The way our, our uh, clan system is set up, the way our family, extended families are set, we were all, we're always taken care of. Um, um, some, in some cases, even to the point where we're babied along, you know, and that to a fault. Lodgegrass guidance counselor Everett Winburn has also seen the influence of the extended family on a young Indian's life. In a lot of ways, the extended family is really positive, but it, but at the same time, once they once if they want to break away from that, it makes it much more difficult to to pull away and to and to uh, uh, cut all those ties. Some Native Americans miss the kinship and support of the reservation so much they return home. Others go home because they feel guilty about leaving family in the first place. And the, and the Indian family's really close-knit, so these kids get lonesome, and they go home. And they're accepted coming home because the Indian family is so close, they're welcome back. There's not that pressure to, you know, go back to school. You gotta have that family support. If that Indian kid wants to come home, take him in, but see if you can get him back. Janine Pease Pretty on Top is the president of Little Bighorn College in Crow Agency. She says not every ball player wants to or is ready to leave the reservation. Some families, just as they raise their kids and the experiences they provide for them, are immediately ready for that extreme change in environment and extreme change in expectations. On the other hand, other families may not have that um, readiness as a part of their family life or their community life. Blacksmith says if the ball player wants to go to a college away from the reservation, Indian families can help. 
the parents have to get them in mind and schooled early enough to know that there's going to come a time for them that they're going to have to leave for a while and then do what they need to do as far as schooling goes then they can come back again you know i think the i think the idea is uh in in the young person's mind when they go they're not going to come back which isn't the case for many montana indians the reservation will always be a special place because it's their home and the home of their ancestors they may leave the reservation and return like spotted bear or carry a piece of it with them like wetzel but the reservation is also a special place to live because of the game of basketball In this season, Spotted Bear is preparing his team to play Crow rival Lodgegrass. First year coach Richard McCormick is getting his squad ready as well. Good job. Good job. We blew them out over here. We enjoyed ourselves. We get over there, we gotta be ready. The game against the Lodgegrass Indians is important. The Indians are from the larger Class B conference and have an established winning tradition. Lodgegrass has five state titles, including a three-peat in 88, 89, and 90. No, you got offensive! The game against the Indians is every bit the battle Spotted Bear expected. One quarter, tough, all right? Take the next quarter the same way. Concentrate on this quarter only, all right? You got that first quarter, look, 20, all right? If you keep playing defense and you keep using teamwork the way you've been doing, you, you know, you'll take them all away. Right? Let's go, all right? At the half, the Plenty Coup Warriors are being out-rebounded by the bigger and stronger team. So you guys got to play the Larry Bird style on the ground. Okay? I don't care if you can jump out of the gym. They got too many guns. It never ends. It goes all the way down their bench. You guys need to get down. Get that Larry Bird style and just play on the ground. Get them out of there. Outsmart them. The Indians are led by point guard Richard McCormick Jr., the coach's son, and returning starter Kendall Deputy. Plenty Coup challenges Lodgegrass, but the Indians pull away for the win and claim Crow Reservation bragging rights this time. When some of Montana's best Indian high school basketball players didn't excel at college basketball, many perceived the gap from reservation ball to Division I was perhaps too wide to bridge. But because of Indian ball players like Malia Kipp and J.R. Camel, that perception is changing. And future young Indian ball players that grow up in gyms like these will benefit from their experiences. Every once in a while, a great ball player comes along and takes our breath away. His creativity, quick reflexes, and instincts for the game put him in a class by himself. Coaches hope and pray this type of player comes along because what he has can't be taught. The University of Montana sophomore guard, J.R. Camel, is just such a player. He's gifted, dynamic, and seems unstoppable on the court. But off the court, Camel has faced difficulties that have threatened to end or slow his basketball career. A strong connection to his family has helped him fight his way back to play ball more than once. 
Camel is of Salish Indian descent and played basketball at St. Ignatius High School on the Flathead Reservation. Before his senior year, he moved to Missoula to live with his brother. Camel attended Missoula's Hellgate High and joined the basketball team. He led the Knights to an undefeated 23-0 season and a state class AA title. Camel's physical talent and keen sense for the game made him a Division I college prospect. And as a Montana Native American, he knew there would be preconceived notions about how he would do as a college player. You know, I looked up to like Elvis Old Bull, Jonathan Takes Enemy, and all them. And they, they all made it to college, or some of them made it, but they ended up giving it up and going back to the reservation. And when I was starting to come up and everybody was talking about, I might go to play Division I, they're all, then I start hearing, like, you're just going to come back to the reservation. And it's, a lot of people get that into their heads, a lot of Native Americans, and it ain't about that. You just have to get over that hump right there. How did you do it, do you think, personally? How did you make that transition? Was it... It was, it was easy for me because I had my family so close to me, like my brother and his wife live in town. Camel knew Indian basketball players in the past had an easier time adjusting to college when they could be around family. My brother, he graduated from the U just about a year and a half ago, and I seen how happy that made my mom feel. And then I just want to, she knows that I can play basketball. And if I can graduate, that would just make her whole year, whole life. Mm -hmm. Camel is making it at Montana despite setbacks in his basketball career. He didn't play college ball the year immediately following high school. He had to meet college admission requirements. But he played the next year with impressive results. Camel played in all 30 of the Grizzlies games, starting twice. He was also runner-up for the league's Freshman of the Year award. The following year, Grizzly coach Blaine Taylor decided it would be best to redshirt Camel a year, allowing him time to mature, adjust to college life, and devote more time to academics. Yeah, I had some long semesters there where I, I just let the school get to me and stuff, but I had to bear down this year. I was redshirting, and I had to get my priorities straightened. What Camel got straight was that he loved basketball and that he wanted to be on the court. Camel was set to come back the next season, but personal problems and the death of his father, Henry, left Camel emotionally drained. He missed school and practice and was out of shape. Once again, it appeared Camel would not be in the picture for a new season, but he bounced back. Camel did more than just return to the lineup. He led the team in scoring, assists, and steals. At the end of the regular season, Camel was selected first team all-conference for the Big Sky. If you put your mind to it, you can pretty much accomplish whatever you really want, but it takes a lot of dedication, hard work. You know, you have to be put those hours in the gym. expect this unassuming woman to be a gutsy, tough basketball player, but she is. She's modest, not flashy. Malia Kipp's style is elegant and smooth. Fanfare is not her forte, but her effectiveness on the court is hard to ignore. Lady Grizz coach Robin Selvig. The fans uh, appreciate the way she played. She played so hard, yet she was quiet about it. I mean, she never, she very seldom shows emotion on the floor, uh, but I think she played a style that, that fans appreciated. Played hard, made big plays. Kip is a member of the Blackfeet tribe. She did more at the University of Montana than pull down rebounds and block shots. Kip helped prove the stereotype that Montana Indians don't stay at college is untrue. In the process, she became a role model for Native Americans, blending traditional beliefs with modern education. Kip made history in 1992 by becoming the first female Montana tribal member to play NCAA Division I college basketball. Like many Montana Native Americans, Kip grew up hearing stories about Indian ballplayers who didn't make it. Early on at UM, she knew how important it would be for her to finish what she started. I feel that I've um, accomplished a lot, even though not. Um, it, when you look at the stats, you wouldn't think that I have. But um, I feel good about what I've accomplished. You know, 
um, playing four years Division One school. That's a lot. You know, a lot of people don't get that chance or that opportunity. And some people do, and they don't stick out with it. And I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad I did it. The roots of Kip's success are easy to trace. Her family played a significant role in helping her attain her goals at college. Parents Carla and Deanne Kip used their experiences to get Malia ready for the University of Montana. They prepared Kip for school away from home by anticipating difficulties she would encounter and by stressing academics. They always made um, it important that school came before athletics and if my grades were low then sometimes I'd miss practice to keep up my grades and stuff and um, miss other events like school dances and they just made it very important that I did good in school. The Kips also knew Malia would be lonesome away from her family, friends, and community. They encouraged her to stay at UM by bringing the Blackfeet Reservation to Missoula. The Kips drove the four-hour one-way car trip from Browning to attend Lady Grizz basketball games. They sat in reserved seats across from the player's bench. Her family, you know, we've supported her, and not just myself and my wife, but her brother and her sisters and her ground folks. You know. Uh, we haven't missed a home game since uh, she's been playing. The foundation of support Kip received from her family and from people in Missoula helps explain her success. That kind of commitment from others made it much easier to get through the inevitable tough times at college away from home. On senior night, Kip and Lady Grizz senior guards Sherry Brooks and Carla Beatty were recognized by elders of the Blackfeet tribe with an honor song for their contribution to the community and the basketball team. Kip's strong connection with Native values while striving for success away from home made Blackfeet Chief Earl Oldperson especially proud. We felt that uh, we should do something for her, being that she has displayed and demonstrated uh, an ability that uh, she had in representing the Blackfeet Nation. And I think this is a, a way that we are keeping our image, our traditional background, and yet we are going forward to live in uh, the future. Malia Kipp and J.R. Camel demonstrated Montana Indians can have cultural pride while playing Division I basketball. They did this by making a wide circle that included their family, Indian people, and basketball.